Welcome to the first ever Your Genius is Showing podcast with Torbjorn and Pills Beats. Episode one, I'm so very excited to get to hang out with these guys and learn about music and uh, see if we can make some magic happen. So um, basically really wanted to provide a podcast that... uh, Producers, music fans, music uh, enthusiasts, artists uh, want to tune into to gain more insight on their creation process and how we can uh, grow together by learning. You know, keep learning. Got to keep learning. So uh, we're going to get into the creation process of Torbjorn here in his Ableton 10 setup. And uh, Tor, thanks for joining us here. Yes, hello. I'm actually uh, embarrassed to say that my real proper production computer is got left back at home. So I am running Ableton Live 9 uh, today on my DJ laptop that I travel with. Um, but I put this new song out uh, just about a week ago on my good friend Bryce's label, Basshound Records. Uh, and this is a song called Man's Got Game, uh, an original beat by me. And so I kind of wanted to deconstruct that a little bit today and, and talk about where my ideas came from to make this beat and um, kind of the concept behind the sound and then getting into a little bit of workflow stuff and a little bit of the technical stuff, uh, choices that I have to make uh, in order to just keep making as much music as quickly as possible, which has kind of been uh, a big goal of mine. see a lot of my friends doing these uh, everyday posts or these 100-day beat challenges and stuff like that. And um, unfortunately, because of my work situation, I can't always commit to like an everyday type of thing, but I still wanted to just knock out a large volume of work uh, in as short a time as possible. And this song was a product of some of the patterns that I developed from doing those kinds of exercises, which was really fun. Awesome. So stoked to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so should we take a listen to the song? Yeah, let's let's see what you got. We'll focus on, uh, the song's almost three minutes long. We can get really deep into it, so maybe we'll just focus on the first half of it. And you guys can definitely find the song on Spotify or SoundCloud uh, online if you want to listen to the whole track. But here we go. Man's Got Game. Got some fire there. Wow. So, uh, so yeah, there's a little uh, taste of that song. Get a couple bars of the second drop on there as well. Maybe it'll entice you to go find the track online if you want to listen to the whole thing. Tor's website is beatsbytor.com. You can find all his links to all his music right there. Yes. And uh, I definitely recommend checking it out because he's got loads of fire tracks. 
and two EPs out this week, right? Is that uh, I had, an, had an EP. EP and a single. Well, I had a single out. Uh, Rapture Studios released a really cool compilation called Concert Nation, like a Halloween themed thing. Uh, and then a couple days after that came out, I had the EP, the Man Scott Game EP came out. And then I just hit a milestone of a of, uh, big round number of followers on Instagram as well. So to nice. say thanks to everybody who follows me there, I put another free beat out. Uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before uh, of the date that we're recording this. Nice. Uh, yeah, so lots of new music out yeah. this fall already, and I've got more to come as well. It's been super fun to watch those roll out. Uh, do you, can you describe like some of the technology other than just Ableton that you use in the studio? Yeah, totally. So it, Ableton is obviously like the, the centerpiece where all the composition takes place. But um, I use a ton of instruments in the studio. I'm like a guitar player and a violin player for have been for many, many years. Um, and a lot of the DJ equipment I use, like the effects on the DJM 900 mixer are really high quality. And, and I have a tendency to like route signal out through that and distort it or use the echoes on there. Um, I love synthesizers. I definitely wish I had the cash to own many of them, but uh, my one big toy that I have at the studio right now is a Moog Little Fatty, nice. uh, which has been super cool for making, uh, kind of recording some fundamental sounds for basses and leads and things like that, and then using plugins and, and all the tools inside of Ableton to kind of manipulate that sound after the fact. Sweet. And then on stage, it's usually CDJs, please. I'm embarrassed to say I can't perform on CDJs. Really? I've uh, I've never like had a homie that owns them that I could practice, and not alone for me. I never. Yeah, <laughs> as Pills beats behind me is like, you're not alone. I can't use them either. Um, <laughs> but I they. I have no idea what what they do. Every <laughs> everyone I've talked to that uses them says they're super easy. Um, but I wouldn't know. They're like over two thousand dollars a piece, and you need at least two of them to DJ on them. And I don't, I don't know. I have other things I would rather spend four thousand dollars on than a fancy CD player. Nice. Um, but I'm using a, a either um, like just a little tractor controller, a X1, and then I have a control vinyl. I like to do like turntablism and a lot of like old school hip hop style nice. DJing tricks. Um, but then if I have to travel and I don't want to bring my own gear or the person that, um, is hiring me to perform doesn't, isn't able to provide the gear, then I have like a little, uh, S4 tractor controller, which is super cool. It fits in my backpack and I can take it as a carry on nice. on an airplane, which is great. Um, getting pretty beat up though. Took it to Burning Man last year, uh, and played like six or seven sets with it. And it's, uh. About time to get a new one of those. Anyways, I digress. So let's check out this song you got here. Uh, so I've popped open the Ableton session here. I've got everything stemmed out um, and pretty organized. This is like for people that do uh, remixes of my songs. Um, Sigra did a remix of this track on the EP. Um, this is the kind of the pack that you would get everything labeled in a big group of like bass instruments um we you can see we've layered some multiple kicks in here a bunch of different snares uh, a bunch of different clap sounds on top of that we've got some percussion stuff this is actually one of the rare tracks that i've done that still has a hi-hat in it um I, i'm really getting away from the hi-hat the like trap hi-hats lately or trying to find a different sound to get that same effect because i'm feeling like people are getting tired of that sound a little bit later and then the effects uh the effects group here um, tons of foley sounds all kinds of little weird sticks breaking and leaves crunching and things like that Let's see here just weird uh kind of textural sounds a lot um, of those you're on recording right? a handful of them are i think I think uh, uh, Pills Beats and I were just talking about this, that we are 
actually like kind of into the effects and uh, fully packs that cymatics have been putting out they kind of get a bad rap for being like the bro step sample company but um some of the more like avant-garde sounds they've been putting out in their packs have been really cool fuck with their crashes bill's beat says he loves their crashes um so those are all the different samples and different sounds that kind of make up this uh, track. But before we get into that, I think there's some really low-hanging fruit, uh, educationally speaking, that you can always learn from someone else's track, which is to outline the form of their song. I remember a lot of my music mentors in like the songwriting world in my high school and college classes talked about this a lot, that if you... Uh, play through a song and can kind of figure out the lengths and the format of each section of someone's song that a lot of the answers as to why instruments come in, in and out or in the case of electronic music why sounds or samples come in and out and why dynamics get louder and quieter you can kind of start to answer a lot of those um, slightly deeper questions just by understanding the order of the song so we don't have to I know the form by heart being the songwriter so we don't have to listen through each part and, and count bars and stuff like that but it's also worth noting that like nine out of ten songs in the world of electronic music are going to be in groups of like eight bars 16 bars 32 bars maybe some shorter for two or four bar sections um, but those big round numbers multiples of four and eight and sixteen and whatnot are really common 24 sometimes will also pop up which is what eight times three, right? I had to like think about my math. What about that swing beat? <laughs> I don't know. That's still four point five. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Totally. Uh, so we've got an intro here that goes for sixteen bars, and we get a fake drop with this big bass sound. We'll just call this drop. You could write. Go in here and be like, press the wrong button. Fake drop, and then really the actual drop happens here, uh, but I usually don't call this drop one. Usually don't get uh, too in detail unless I'm like leaving a little note for myself. I might know that uh, here, four bars before we have another big round number, bar 49, I might do something like build up here or drums stop here those little notes like can be useful for later because we're not necessarily like composing the drums right now but we want to leave a little bonus reminder there um, every uh, uh, piece of advice that a good producer friend of mine Cosmo told me is that every eight bars you should have some kind of variation so we can pretty much skip ahead every eight bars and know in this section of the drop, for example, there's like some extra Foley sounds that we didn't hear in the first eight bars, and then we skip ahead another eight bars, and yep. we're basically getting the same theme, but this one, there's like way more variation, a lead and that hi-hat pattern comes in. So I would call this like uh, drop one V or uh, variation. Just have to obsessively fix my capitalizations there. I think it was Subaqueous uh, said in a, a lesson once that we were both at that when you spell stuff correctly and color code everything, your beats sound better. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we can skip ahead another eight bars and get some variation there. We can hear that there's like a build up happening, get a little vocal drop. And then bar 49, we've got definitely a whole new theme, not including any of the sounds from what we were hearing before, so we can safely call that drop two. That's yep. its own section. Skip ahead eight. Same kind of thing. We're adding this hi-hat sound now. And we're getting our big variation. Watching you fill out a Mad Libs. Yeah, totally. 
insert a verb here. Insert wobble. And then you can hear that we were getting the same buildup thing happening here in the second half of the drop two variation that we were getting in the second half of the drop one variation. So a lot of the same like uh, parts of the form of the song, like this is a uh, this build up thing that's happening here. I would like consider a dynamic change, a change in volume or intensity. We're kind of getting some of that same ebb and flow. Um, as these things are repeating. Get another fake drop, and then we're basically hearing this kind of drop one variation two. So by fake drop, are you meaning like a transition or uh, like pre, pre drop? Really, really good question. Um, so as I was saying before, you kind of expect that on these big round numbers, these one, 17, 33, 49, these are kind of when you're expecting like the, the new theme of like, or a big musical change to be happening uh, at that bar number. And so by two times in the song, having a buildup and having a big change happen on this downbeat. And then again here, having another buildup and you're expecting would be following the same pattern, another big change happening, some like loud dynamic sound. We actually kind of create this deceptive dynamic that it's building up and up and up and then you don't get that oh, big okay. dynamic hit you get a very low dynamic followed by a high dy dynamic which seems now even more intense because the sound that came before it was so low energy so low key let's take a listen to it There's some crazy stuff with um, some effects returns that uh, you are in the recording that was released, but that you won't hear on the stems, because uh, I actually don't give people my uh, effects return stems for when they remix. I don't know why. I've always just been like, man, you got to make your own. That's the whole point of the remix. Uh, Sigra did the remix of this song, and he didn't get any of the effects returns, and the stuff that he came up with was like, really really cool so i was like super glad that he was kind of forced creatively to have to to supplement in that way he did a really good job with it um then after here bar 97 is our big next big round number and we basically get the same drum beat that we've been hearing um throughout the majority of the drops but we get it without all the bass sounds without all of the like big Foley and effect sounds. There's a few of them in there, but it's definitely uh, lower energy than it was at the beginning. Kind and of um, dance. Yes, no, and that's exactly, that's exactly the point is uh, that this section here in the outro, as well as this section here in the intro, these are sections that I know in my live sets are gonna be transitioning from a previous song into this song and then from this song into the next song and i want that beat that rhythm to be seamless so that anyone that is dancing or nodding their head or whatever that motion that's invoked from like listening to this kind of music that you don't have to skip any beats in the way that your body would want to move because of the music and so i specifically write these loopable sections into all of my songs so we can give an example here. If we listen to the first eight bars of the song. It'll loop over seamlessly for as long as I let it play. And this is exactly what I do in my live sets is I have, um, I perform live with Tractor and uh, I'll have this section looped here and I'll have my fader down at you know, between 30 and 50% of how loud the volume can get on that channel. And I'll just introduce this sound over the outro or over the last drop or whatever of the previous uh, song in my sets to kind of introduce some of these ideas and then slowly fade it. And then when it's time for this track that we're listening to here to be the main track that we're hearing, you just disengage that loop and it plays through the rest of the intro and gets to the drop. 
And same thing in the outro. Usually the first eight bars of the outros of my songs um, do that same thing. So I've set this on a loop now. And then this would be looping while the following song is like building up. And when we're getting to the point where, if you think about our big round numbers again, that the drop of the next song would happen, there's like a little build up towards the very, very end of this song just to kind of help that cause leading into the next track. So do you often shift, uh, how much in tempo do you often shift during a live set? Um, my sets go all over the place. I, I'm in 160 to 180 BPM a lot. Um, that seems to just kind of be what's popular with my crowds these days. Um, but I've been really getting into a lot of beats down in the 110 to 130 range. And so I've actually had to write a couple tracks that change BPM in the track so that I can like get down to those lower tempos without having to like grab that tempo fader and drastically yeah. change the beat to have it happen in some like creative way that distracts or I don't know, tells a story or something like that. So it's a little more interesting and, and doesn't quite kill the vibe when we're changing in tempo by like 50 BPM or something like that. That's a pretty big jump. Trying to remember, uh, I think it was a DJ uh, Sinistar. I saw him play up in Seattle a couple years ago, and he had a couple tracks that were like big tempo changes in the tracks, and it was super effective, and the crowd responded really well to it, and it was like told this kind of sonic story. And I, ever since seeing him do that, I really wanted to uh, figure out a cool way to incorporate that into my sets because I was like, man, I've never seen that go down so well and have a crowd like be so receptive to uh, a big tempo shift like that. Um, so we can kind of pop open some of these stems here and look into uh, look into the tracks. Um, I guess maybe before we just like start naming what there is, there's might be worth talking a little bit about the, the why of some of the decisions that I made. I always try to think of um, some kind of a theme or an idea or like try to figure out what I want to say with the song that I'm writing. Uh, and there's a TV show, British TV show about like a pirate radio station, like a comedy, kind of the office style comedy uh, that I was watching. And someone said this quote in that show, and they said, man's got game. And they were talking about their friend, like as, as like a, a cockney slang way to say that he has skills They were like, Oh, a man's got game. And I was like, that's really funny that I love how that's like, it sounds like not really that tough from the, the, to the ear of like an American person, but that's like an extremely tough sounding thing to say in uh, London. And I just thought that was so funny and I wanted to like encapsulate that feeling in a beat somehow. And so I started thinking about kind of what, I could do sonically uh, that would like give off that vibe. So where did you, you got that sample from the TV show? That's actually me saying that. Oh, okay. Nice. But it's, uh, yeah, it's inspired. Um, so I was thinking about things that were like kind of tough sounding and uh, thinking about, I, I have had spent a little time um, living in England and I had this idea of like all these, uh, I was actually living in Liverpool, but, but I was thinking of like these kind of like industrial sort of looks that they have this like the old buildings and a lot of things are like brick and, and I was just sort of like had this idea of like a working class town, like steel mill kind of, kind of thing. It's, I'm not quite sure how to, how to explain it, but just like an old, the image like of a of an old town with like smokestacks and like people working on boats and stuff and so I was trying to think of like what those sounds would be and I found these foley sounds. Let's see if I can find the the there's a couple other really good ones that are in this song. 
I think they might be in the percussion group, actually. Yeah. So what? Yeah, it's this one right here. Sounds like a bad one. Man's got game. Man's got game. That's my <laughs> goofy voice. Um, yeah, just, I don't know, it felt like an old, like, factory, like I was saying, steel mill or something. Just trying to find all these, like, metal, metal sounding. Very eerie. And, uh, because a lot of the, a lot of the beats I'm making are not, necessarily melodic or harmonic in the traditional way it's it's a it's very much like rhythmic focused and then focused uh <clears throat> after kind of figuring out the rhythmic aspect it's like sort of what can you do with the sonic space in the like low end of the frequency spectrum and can you think about some of the stages at these like bigger electronic music festivals like edc all the way down to the like independent and and smaller ones like the, all the same like the uh, UNS festivals and the emissions festivals and those kind of things is it's like sound systems where there's three times as many subs as there are tops and that is a result and also a breeder in like the music that gets played there um, so a big part of the like soundscape that I try to pay a lot of attention to is in that like sub 100 hertz range even like sub 40 hertz range again we're talking about frequencies like the pitch of the notes and uh, what sounds are reproduced by the higher pitch smaller speakers in a sound system versus the big lower speakers the subwoofers and um, for those people that have been to big festivals and heard big sound systems they'll know um, but for the people that haven't, <clears throat> the size of those speakers can literally uh, shake the ground sometimes and be uh, not only be sonically impactful some, to someone, but be physically impactful to someone. And it can be some pretty powerful stuff who's like really there to listen to some music. And that's kind of kind of the goal there. So we'll like focus on this now that we've heard some of the Foley sounds. Again, I'm not putting a lot of pianos or, or string instruments or... Um, Know, woodwinds or any traditional like orchestral instrumentation in a lot of my beats so a lot of that sonic has to come from those foley sounds those like sounds like we were saying of uh pieces of metal clanking on the ground or chains or uh, sticks breaking or leaves being stepped on and putting those somehow in like a rhythmic way that offers some musical value uh, as well as like some unique sonic value uh, and then moving on to these bass sounds here a um, little more freedom down here to not have to be super organic as I was with those Foley sounds. Um, but it's a lot of like movement in the pitch, a lot of like texture, adding uh, artificial like mid-range and high-range uh, frequency content to create something interesting there. So let's listen to just these bass stems soloed. So it's interesting, a lot of that stuff doesn't necessarily sound like it makes musical sense on its own, but once you add the kicks and the snares in there, let's hear the context of that rhythmically. A 
lot of uh, offbeat notes and uh, polyrhythms and stuff like that. A lot of these sounds are started as um, sine waves. Uh, I just have the stems here, so I don't have all of the uh, like device view to show what plugins and stuff I was using, but <clears throat> a lot of saturation of, of really low pitch sine waves uh, to add that kind of like mid-range texture. A lot of um, on uh, Ableton using the overdrive and the erosion audio effects to add a lot of high frequency content that is not necessarily there in the first place. That's a great example of a sound that uses that, that little fill there as well. And uh, Sound Toys Decapitator, I'm using on to add that high frequency content to basses a lot. Uh, so we talked about kind of the rhythmic aspect that you get from the kick and the snare as well, um, which is like really adds a lot of context to the rhythm of that bass stuff, which is playing some weird polyrhythm things and strange rhythms. I love the idea of thinking about the lower frequencies first in the songwriting and I, it makes me think about the progression of being in at, uh, Adventure Club at you know, 2011 and how everything progressed up to and now we've spent some more time in huge sound systems and what you can do with those sub frequencies and, and like it, it takes you back to that not drop and that teasing of rhythmic because um, you're you're surrounding the people in the bass and, and feeling that oscillation. I can I can really feel uh, how those ba bass frequencies hit people like energetically differently in their bodies and where you would be in the crowd and and adding the foley on top and just creating that whole atmosphere. I'm, I'm all about it. I love it. Yeah, it's really, um, <clears throat> when you first experience it, it's pretty powerful stuff. Like uh, the sound of something that's literally vibrating your entire body. You can like feel all those note changes in your gut from the, the sub. Um, and yeah, it's funny that you mentioned like uh, Adventure Club. I think, uh, I think this is an, another thing that uh, my buddy Cosmo had told me, but he, we were talking about seeing this pattern in, uh, in music, like that emphasizes the high frequencies versus emphasizing the low frequencies and, and some of the first big hits in uh, dubstep, for example, were like very lo-fi sounding and it just really focused on movement in the low frequencies. And then the further along the genre progressed, more people were like, adding more and more sounds to all of this. It was getting brighter and bigger and more epic sounding. And then as we kind of moved past the the uh, dubstep thing and, and kind of like trap sounds were sort of taking over some of the uh, some of the festival main stages, like all of a sudden we got back to the idea of like just a few sounds and a really big, clean 808 bass sound. And then that was really, and then more people kept interjecting and interjecting and it got, you know, the bubble grew and grew and grew and burst and now we're hearing all these like lo-fi subgenres again the halftime thing and the wave thing and even some of the lo-fi hip-hop beats and the like funk beats uh, as well i don't know if you how much of a soundcloud uh geek you are but all these terms these new terms keep creeping up as people get tired of uh tired of the old styles lo-fi lo hip-hop bro got the lo-fi lo hip-hop bro I do watch that YouTube channel all the time when uh, I'm cooking. All right, so the drum pattern in here, the kick and, and snare. Um, I always think of like the, the kick and snare kind of being the bread and butter of what determines the genre of music that you're playing. Uh, the, the three, I break it up into like three categories. You've got the... Um, the tempo of the song being the broadest, obviously the, the drum beat that you're playing has to adhere to the tempo of the song. And so that plays the same type of break beat played at uh, 125 beats per minute might 
be considered breaks, but if you play it at um, 85 or, or 170 BPM, all of a sudden it becomes a drum and bass uh, drum beat, right? So that tempo can contextualize a lot of things about genre. Uh, the second category uh, is like the timbre, uh, which refers to like the actual quality of the sound, like what type of snare is it? Is Does it sound like it came from an 80s drum machine? Does it sound like it, an actual snare drum played by a human being on a drum kit? Is it some like weird experimental type sound like you're banging on a trash can and like resampling that as a snare drum? That's kind of like another big thing that adds context to it. And then of course the third thing is like the actual notes that it plays, like the rhythmic pattern. And so for this um, for this beat, it was like this. I would I would call this type of music roughly. I would call this type of music halftime. Um, kind of a, a term coined in the UK by some of the like drum and bass guys that started taking a lot of that same sensibility and started making like hip hop beats. And they were taking their uh, 175 BPM, or I'm sorry, their 170 BPM drum beats and were like basically playing them at 85 BPM, playing at them at half time. And it sounded like old school hip hop. And so if we just solo the kick and the snare in the clap, that's kind of the sound that I was going for uh, with the note pattern, with the tempo of the song 168, which is would be 84 BPM, I think, if, depending on how you grid it. You can double or half the, the tempo when you start writing a song and it sounds the same. It just depends on, on how you, you can't do it after you write a song. It will sound very, very different. But it just depends on where you like to see those grid numbers. Uh, and for me, I don't know, the way my brain works, I like to work between 100 and 200 BPM usually makes the most sense uh, to me. Uh, but I digress. The, the timbre of the sounds, I was definitely going for more experimental stuff. The claps should, by and large, sound like actual people clapping in in my dream world all my claps on my tracks sound like uh, zap and rogers more bounce to the ounce <laughs> but i've never been able to like quite get that sound perfect so i'm just faking it until i make it uh, but the snares i wanted to get away i've been using these like breakbeat these like live drum kit snares for a long time to kind of get that old school hip-hop feel but i've kind of moved away from that and this one had some weird like bell kind of tonal sound. I think we've got like layering four sounds here. We've got one called snare clap. Kind of like a Lex Luger trap sounding snare. Now we've got this snare thud. It looks like that's where a lot of the low end of the snare is coming from. A little of the high uh, breathy frequencies as well. And then a trap snare. Nice. I like to pick these really like I don't mean any disrespect to to like all the producers that use these kind of snares. But I would call this like a really weak, just like super lame sounding snare. But when you do these snare rolls with it, all of a sudden it sounds so awesome. And I, I've never like understood why. Like all the Drake beats and Migos beats and stuff have, have snares like that and is it sounds so dumb, and then as soon as there's a little snare roll, then I'm sold on that sound completely. I guess if you have a snare that really punches through, it's hard to do it 16 times. Yeah, you'll end up sounding like a black metal drummer or something. Yeah. And then I've got this track, uh, Weird Snare, and that's that tonal thing that I was talking about. Looks like we're getting a little bit of low end from that as well. So yeah, I'm just trying to was just trying to do something different again the this kind of weird snare thing was sort of like trash can metal like oil drum sounding to my ears and it kind of fit with the weird sort of like uh blue collar like british town that i had in my head when i was trying to come up with sound design for this one so let's just solo that clap and the snare and the kick and listen to that pattern Layering two kicks, just quickly show these. We've got a real beefy low end one. 
It's got a little bit of mid-range click and then a real airy one. It's really cool to, to switch up the dynamic of your drums to layer sounds like that and then have them layered on some notes and have them not layered on other notes. Variation is key. So yeah, let's listen to all those together. Did you put an EQ on all those too? Yeah, so each one of these has uh, saturation and um, probably a multi-band EQ, I'm sorry, a multi-band compressor, and then a broadband compressor, and then an EQ. Um, and a multi-band compressor is like a volume control for the different frequency groups, so it has like an independent level control for the low, for the middle frequencies, for the high frequencies, just to help balance the sound a little bit. And then a broadband compressor just listens to the whole sound. When it gets too loud, it turns it down just a little bit. But it works in these like tiny micro little movements that happen very, very fast. So it can be very great. It's like having like a little helper automatic volume control on every one of the sounds in your track, nice. uh, which can be super helpful. Um, and then an EQ is like manual volume control for the different frequency groups. If you think about it like that, so you can manually turn down the high pitch sounds, the middle sounds, the low pitch sounds, um, with great detail, as as pretty much as much detail as you would like, um, and that exists on each one of these sounds in the whole track as well. And that's kind of that tonal balancing between the highs, the mids, and the lows, and all that stuff is like really crucial in getting your uh, mix to sound good and layering those sounds and like I said uh, with the snares like some sample selection can be even more important than the effects that you put on it you gotta pick the right sound to begin with again thematically like for the concept that I was thinking of this song I had this idea of this like old working class British town and then also sonically you wanna make sure that you don't pick layer three or four different very high pitch sounding snares or the combination of all those high pitch sounds together will just be way too much. You need to find stuff that supplements the high pitch frequencies, the low, middle frequencies, the low frequencies, and then balance accordingly uh, so that you get the fullest sound uh, and you get the most balanced sound. And yeah, a lot of the, I've kind of just picked sounds that I liked based on uh, those things, sonic choices and thematic choices and like, like conceptual choices. And then the order in which I put them really uh, comes down to back to that form that we talked about at the very beginning. Uh, knowing that every eight bars, I'm going to need to add some kind of variation and so I kind of like, if you think of it like a palette, like a painter, I kind of just put all these different sounds on my palette and then um, go in order of the song. A lot of times I'll start writing uh, the first drop. And once I've got that first drop, then I'll go back and write the intro. And, uh, then, at, and then some of the ideas usually that are happening in the intro then get reintroduced in this variation of the drop. And so ultimately it's like, uh, like an A, B, A, B, A, B, A kind of form in a lot of my songs where it's like patterns that are happening every eight bars that then you zoom out and grab um, 32 bars of that and we have four different eight bar sections within those 32 bars if you want to think about it like that. And so those same type of changes, and often a lot of those same sounds, will be reintroduced in the following 32 bars in the same order that they were in the 32 bars previous. And so if you start looking at a lot of, especially in the percussion section here, and down 
in the if we unfolded this effects section here you'll see a lot of those um, not necessarily the exact sounds getting repeated but definitely the order in which things are happening and being combined uh, you can start to see like some bigger patterns in there especially with the effects the impacts and the risers you can pretty much expect those uh, to repeat every 32 bars because if I'm what I'm considering a drop and a variation on that drop typically happens within 32 bars in most of my songs so most of your songs uh, they're obviously all performed in a DJ set do you ever uh, expand into like more of a journey type realm or ambient type realm uh, with your with your songs I have been writing almost exclusively very high energy hip-hop inspired music but I think I've written enough of that stuff in the last three years to where it's time for me to start experimenting with a little more sonic storytelling and a little more of the lower dynamic range and lower uh, volume range. And actually, um, a couple of the songs that I have forthcoming experiment a lot with space in between notes and uh, very like relaxing sonics. And one of the songs that I actually just released is probably more in that direction than anything I've put out uh, ever. Nice. And um, yeah, it was actually, uh, are you familiar with Zhu, Z-H-U? Uh, no, I'm not. Zhu is a, a real popular, like main, very mainstream artist, songwriter. It was the person that wrote that song, uh, Faded. Baby, I'm waiting. Yeah, exactly. Really, really super successful song. Really, really catchy chorus. Um, his He and his guitar player and saxophone player played a gig in Seattle a couple weeks ago that I caught. And I was so inspired by their set how the like really low energy, very soft sounds and often a lot of the silence was used in like such a suspenseful way. I was like, had been to all these like high energy concerts where it's just like drop after drop after drop and the sound design is so awesome and the beats are so cool and it's just like noise and like stimuli constantly that seeing the like inverse or the, or the other side of the spectrum of that uh, at that zoo concert, I was like, man, there's a lot of power in silence and I really uh, have been feeling very motivated to explore that recently. So yeah, if we could sum up, uh, sum up the like, the why of the songwriting here. I think it's it's real easy for me to go through and and like show all of the. Um, what I did to make these synth sounds and what effects I use and stuff like that. But I think there's plenty of tutorials out there like that. Probably uh, people that do it even better than I do. Um, but I think the like why and the thematic and the kind of like conceptual side of my songwriting would be the, uh, would be something that might be unique here that someone might take something away from. So if I had to wrap it all up, I would say, um, know your song form uh, or have an idea of what your song form could be before you really start digging too much into it. Um, and I know there's a lot of people out there that like to sketch and just start writing the first thing that comes to mind. And that's great. But, but once you start to get an idea down on paper, start to think about what part of the song are you writing right now? Is it an intro? Is it like a breakdown, bridge kind of interlude thing? Or is it a chorus? Is it a verse? Is it a drop? Like what can you call that? So you can start to kind of map out, is there gonna be something that comes before this? Is there gonna be something that comes after this? Are those things gonna be louder or quieter than what I'm writing right now? And kind of coming up with some of those like big picture things 
uh, first can really help you avoid writer's block and kind of getting in a rut. Um, and then the other thing is like if you can have a picture in your head, you can have a movie in your head, uh, like I did with this song, uh, the like notion of the overconfident British person in a working class town. I don't know that that's necessarily like what the listener will hear when they hear this beat, but it definitely was something that quickly helped me set, uh, uh, create a set of rules and like a direction for what sounds I would want to include and uh, what things I might not want to include in this beat. That was super helpful. And then um, after that, the patterns, right? So you've got your you've got your form. I could like roughly break this down into a bunch of 16 bar sections. Um, but again, these drops, knowing that, that I wanted to have 30, roughly 32 bars of the first drop, 32 bars of the second drop, and that I wanted to have some kind of variation or change every eight bars, um, really have helped me, again, just kind of put together a set of rules. Like I could write ideas for eight bars and then know that I would really need to switch something up at that point. And then I had done that a second time that I was going to really need to look back on that 16 bars previous, those two variations, and I would need to make another even bigger change, uh, a bigger departure from that in the 16 bars to follow. And then knowing that I've got now, uh, by doing that same process with the second 16 bars, that I've got this whole 32 bar segment, I can kind of create, I've created the blueprint, right? So I'm not necessarily going to have repeat the same sounds in the second drop. I'm probably, well, obviously in this song, I've used a whole different set of bass sounds, but the order in which, like where we have a buildup, um, where we're having little drum breaks and stuff like that, I can kind of just pull from this same blueprint here in the first drop. Um, and then if you wanted to, uh, this ended up being primarily like a, tr a two drop song, but a lot of songs go into a third drop here. And then again, you can just follow that same blueprint. Um, come up with a new set of sounds for your bass, for your harmony, for your Foley sounds, whatever you're going for. And then just kind of follow that eight bar variation segment. Um, and then again, I, my intros and outros are very similar solely for the fact that I'm like just looking for something that's easy to loop so I can transition into the next song live. If I'm only doing a two drop song, a lot of times I will uh, reprise back to that first drop just for 16 bars at the end just to add like a little extra callback so it's not all constantly new ideas that are not repeating. And yeah, I think that's, uh, if we're talking big picture stuff here, that's like, those are the three, the three things. Form, sound design concept, and patterns. If you can uh, come up with a set of rules for those three things, uh, then a lot of the choices that you'll have to make for your songwriting, uh, hopefully, should be form factor enough for you to like, always feel like you know what the next step is going to be. Thanks so much for all that insight. I'm super enlightened now. <laughs> um, I'm excited to uh, hear what you got next. Uh, we get to go to a birthday party this evening with Tor and Till's Beats and a huge lineup of IMC's birthday. He's having uh, Kaji and... I need a list in front of me. But. There's so many people on the lineup, and and a lot of them I have had not heard before, uh, getting booked to play this. But when I followed up on everyone's SoundCloud, I genuinely every artist was like, okay, I think I could like really get into this. This is really cool, and it's awesome. I, I've never shared the stage with Kaji before, and I've liked his music for a long time, so I'm really excited for that. Nice. Yeah, we got Iro in the basement working on tunes. He he just uh, did some music with Kaji most recently with Wormhole um, and yeah he's playing tonight as well so, yeah I'm, I'm super stoked all the homes coming out um, yeah shout out to the geodesic art collective uh, for hosting all these really cool underground shows they definitely have provided a platform for a lot of cool music that doesn't always get a shot in the nightlife and they have uh, totally created this like really 
great space where that stuff can flourish. So big thanks to them for doing that stuff down here in Portland. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any major events coming up that you'd like to inform the people about or any news? Uh, yes, end of November, I will be going on tour down to Southern California. I'll be playing Wormhole Wednesdays, um, the week of Thanksgiving. And then that following weekend, I'll be down in L.A. playing Bass Waffles. And then the weekend following that, I will be flying out to Maui. And we're throwing a big party with the Maui UBF crew for um, my 30th birthday party, which I'm very excited about. What? what? Yeah. Dang. Tour date's coming up. So uh, really looking forward to it. It's been several months since I got to do some tour dates and uh, don't get to go down to Southern California too often, but I always like to see some homies and catch some sun while I'm down there. So uh, is there anything like that's really on your heart that you just gotta just gotta talk about? Like, uh, what, what are your feelings like? Do you, uh, you got any feelings you want to express? Non-related to music or business or uh, anything? Just like, what's, what's on your mind? Um, yeah. Uh, one time I was talking to this guy, Marty Party, he's another music producer. And he said he had a couple drinks and was kind of being more friendly than you might expect a sober person to be. And we got into this like very funny conversation about what what is life like? How is our life similar or different to uh, people that are less fortunate than us or people that are more fortunate than us? And he said something really profound, which I thought was very funny at the time. And then listening back, I was like, man, this he might really be onto something, which is that life is just like a sine wave, like your little uh, circular looking sine wave thing. And uh, if you know anything about sine waves, it's that to create a frequency, the higher the highs go, the lower the lows have to go. And if you're chasing those highs, you got to be ready for those low lows because they're coming you can't control it that's just how the vibration works no longer. and uh and so he was saying he's like you know looking up to all these like major players in business and in politics and in the music industry and whatever is they have these high high lows but we never or we have they have these high high highs that we get to see but we never get to see how hard their lows are and he was like i bet they're for all these famous and rich and super successful people, he's like, I bet those lows hurt really bad, man. I bet it's like really painful and hard to deal with. And he was like, and I don't know that I'm willing to deal with those lows. And so for that reason, I have like focused on keeping my sine wave as close to the middle as I can. And when I'm up in the positive, I appreciate that I'm in the positive. And when I'm down in the negative, I appreciate that there is another positive coming soon. It's not going to go too low. And I was like, kind of laughed at him. I was like, oh, man, you're drunk, whatever. Green room talk. And then I sobered up and thought about it the next day. And I was like, man, I'm going to live my whole life by that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally do. I'm just That's how I like achieve my meditative chi state nice. is by thinking about the sine wave. Thank you for that interlude. Yeah. Also, thank you for your original encouragement at the Audio Grove uh, retreat that I originally mentioned this idea for a podcast because I, I have a big desire to meet talented people and uh, so mad props and thank you for being my first guest and yeah, man. bringing those beats along. And helping, Very cool that this is happening. Helping the dream work. Next we got Pills Beats. I was shifting on over.